Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Our speaker is OSU Extension Livestock Marketing Specialist, Dr. Daryl Peel. Dr. Peel will discuss the prospects for grazing cattle on wheat pasture this year. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in the lower right corner. This webinar is part of our ongoing Learn at Lunch series. For additional information on this and other farm management topics, visit our eFarm Management website. I'll, I will paste this address into the chat box. Dr. Peel, I'll turn it over to you now. All righty. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for tagging along with us uh, this afternoon. Um, we'll take a little look at this uh, winter stocker situation uh, as, it, uh, as it looks at this point in time. It's kind of a... Uh, a little bit uncertainty this time. We've got a lot of changes in the market. I guess first of all, let's start by kind of looking at the the physical prospects, production prospects for having wheat pasture. Uh, I pulled a mesonet map um, a day or so ago, uh, early this morning, I guess. And uh, you know, this is the last 30 days around the state. We've we've had some moisture, quite a bit of moisture in some places, not too much in in a few areas, but in general, you know, we I think we've got moisture to work with. Um, if you look at the uh, the latest drought monitor map for the state of Oklahoma, shows a dry area down in the southwest part of the state, uh, a, as much as a a, a D3 uh, area at some in some places, uh, but not very much really. And most of this has developed relatively recently um, uh, as we as we go forward. So you know. Uh, Across the board, I'd say there's pretty decent uh, prospects uh, for for some uh, some wheat pasture this year. Yesterday, I had occasion to drive west of Stillwater to Hennessy, and then I drove south on Highway 81 and uh, jogged over and, and wound up in Anadarko for a meeting last night. And, uh, you know, I saw um, uh, several drills running, planting wheat. I saw some wheat that was already planted. And I saw a lot of ground uh, getting ready for planting, uh, a lot of anhydrous going down, uh, a lot of trailers out on the road and in the field. So, um, so you know, I think we're we're in a situation this year where we can have uh, potential for some some early you know early forage, and and I think there'll be interest in that. Um, I pulled a. Uh, you know, a shallow plant available water map from Mesonet, and again, it shows by and large, uh, you know, decent conditions uh, around the state with a few exceptions. Uh, so again, it looks to me like, uh, now I didn't see any wheat up, I suspect there's a little bit up, but probably not a lot yet, but I think we'll probably be seeing some here uh, before too long. So that said, we'll get into talking a little bit about the, the market side of this thing a little bit. Not going to do a full-blown cattle market outlook. Uh, that wasn't the deal for today. Certainly, if you have questions, though, as we go forward or, or at the end, uh, we'll have plenty of time, I think, to, to take those. But let me just summarize kind of the, the current situation by saying that, uh, you know, we had a long period of pretty stable markets, and that really has changed this last summer. Uh, the last three or four months has been pretty tough. Uh, a lot of dynamics in this cattle market, and, and feeder cattle markets in particular, have, uh, have have gotten pretty defensive. They're pretty skittish right now. Uh, we're working, of course, uh, in, in a broad sense in an, in an environment of, of lots of cattle, relatively speaking. I mean, we're roughly peak uh, cyclical supplies, inventories of cattle. Uh, so there's plenty of cattle out there. Uh, we've been dealing pretty well with that over the last two or three years as we've built up cattle numbers. Uh, but there's certainly a threat there that we could, uh, you know, could see some additional pressure from that. We're still working as we have been for many, many months in a very turbulent, broader environment in terms of trade and, and the macroeconomic situation. Some of that looks a little scarier to me now than it has in the past. So I'm, I, I've been nervous uh, on some of that for quite a while. Um, I'm, I'm at, at least that nervous, if not a little more nervous on some of that. And I think the market's reflecting that to some extent. Um, you know, we've got uh, one of the new things that really added this year was we had uh, horribly late planting conditions for corn markets in the Midwest. Uh, that led to a lot of uncertainty about where we were and where we are really still uh, with this corn crop. Uh, we really don't know acreage yet very well. We don't know yields. We've got a lot of late corn out there that, uh, you know, it, it's, it may make if we have uh, a late fall, a late frost. 
but if it gets cut off here uh, anytime, then that will you know cut into that. So there's some uncertainty there. Now I'm less worried about the feed market side at this point than I was uh, perhaps a, a month or five weeks ago. Uh, it looks to me like we're probably not going to see a significant shortage uh, in that, but the risk is still there and there's still a lot of uncertainty and I think the market's reflecting that. Of course, about five weeks ago, uh, we had the plant fire uh, in, at the Tyson plant uh, near uh, Garden City, Kansas, uh, Finney County plant, uh, took that plant offline, caused a uh, you know, fairly uh, disruptive uh, impact on box beef markets, fed cattle markets, and feeder cattle markets. And much of that has worked its way through the system um, for the most part, although it set off some things that I think there's still certainly some residual effects. Uh, particularly in the fed cattle market, but even to some extent, I think it's still playing into the feeder cattle market. So the result of all that is we've had relatively weak feeder futures uh, really since about May. If you look at this chart, I don't know, I hope you can see this okay. Um, this is the October feeder cattle contract. And you can see where we were. Oh, I got to, just a minute, I got to click on the pointer here. Okay. So if you can see back where we were in, in early May, we were up in, you know, we were still up above a, a, a buck fifty on these feeder cattle con, the feeder cattle futures for October. Uh, we had a fairly serious uh, correction in this market, uh, frankly, uh, you know, that went to, into early June. Um, from my standpoint, you know, the first half of that correction was probably needed. We had carried a very strong. Uh, probably a, a, an overly strong feeder cattle uh, futures contract through the winter. Um, and then, but as is often the case with the futures, then we took it down uh, almost that much more, probably overcorrected there, uh, but then kind of stabilized and sort of stayed in that range of the low 40s, uh, low 140s to high, you know, 130s for, for this feeder cattle contract through much of the summer. Again, some uh, anxiety relative to the corn market and so on. And then, of course, when the plant fire happened here, we had a big gap downwards. And so we've been trading in a much lower range here in the low 130s recently. Now, when I pulled this chart uh, for October just a little bit ago, about an hour ago, uh, the October contract was uh, uh, making a pretty strong run back up to try to fill this gap. And so we may, you know, we may see that if we break through that, then we'll have to see if we can... Uh, you know, maybe get back up into this this low 140s trading range or whether we can hold that or not. So again, the market's been pretty dynamic. Uh, that's sort of the message here. Um, and it's had a big impact on cash markets. And I'm going to show you that here in, in just a second as we look at sort of where we are now with these markets and then where we might be going. If you look at uh, just a plot of uh, Oklahoma City cash prices, this is for seven to 750 pound steers. And so this sort of plots it out back over the last several years on a monthly average basis. And then what I put on here, these red dots show uh, when I did this, which was a day or so ago, uh, show where the, uh, the, the futures contracts for the next eight months, which would, would put this market. Now I actually didn't, I was, I was too lazy to put in a basis. You could probably add about three bucks to these or red dots. Um, but it's not going to change it a great deal, at least on the scale of this graph. So that's kind of what the futures is is suggesting for this market going forward. Um, now, the futures market is supposed to and does to some extent anticipate uh, future market conditions, but it's certainly not right that, uh, you know, that previous chart, um, you know, obviously shows that over the period of the last four or five months, we've changed our mind a lot on where we thought we would be by October. Um, and we're still uh, we're still seeing those dynamics. So uh, so this was at one point in time, kind of what the futures was showing. You can uh, you know you can take that for what it is. Certainly when we look at hedging prospects, uh, but uh, it you know again this market's been fairly dynamic. Um, this is the normal seasonal patterns uh, for uh, feeder cattle uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, so if you look at this red and the blue line, that really is our calf prices. So where we are now, September, we're usually coming down towards our seasonal low uh, in October. Um, that would suggest that from September into October, we would expect a little bit more uh, additional weakness in these prices. Uh, I'm going to argue in a minute that that may not happen. These seasonal patterns are pretty strong, and that's always where I start looking at markets. But 
uh, there are also reasons why they don't they don't follow. And, and this summer, again, has been a case where we have not always followed the seasonal patterns as closely as we do sometimes. So, But the general tendency is, is there. Obviously, as we get into the big run of uh, calves in the fall, we typically see our lowest prices of the year uh, in October and then uh, start to recover a little bit after that. So that's kind of the underlying uh, potential there. Again, we've got relatively large uh, you know, calf crop coming at us this fall. Uh, so there'll be plenty of, of reason to think that that could happen uh, at any rate. Um, if you look at the bigger feeder cattle, just keep in mind that you have very different seasonal patterns as you get up to the big feeder cattle. Seven and eight weight cattle uh, typically have their low in the early part of the year, February or March, and then build to a, su uh, a late summer high, July and August. Now again, we didn't follow that so much this year. so. Uh, it doesn't always work. We've had lots of things going on this year that sort of disrupted that seasonal pattern. Uh, but you want to keep it in mind, and, and certainly that's sort of where you begin uh, the discussion about, uh, you know, where you're going to go next. Um, okay, let's see if this thing steps through these like I want it to. Eh, it pulled them all at once. Okay. Um, it, this shows the prices in Oklahoma. This is the Oklahoma auction average for the last three weeks. So if you go back to the end of October, or the end of August, excuse me, uh, this was the prices across weights uh, for steers in Oklahoma on average. And then you move ahead to Labor Day week, and the market had dropped. Uh, it had dropped more for the calves and really dropped the most for these uh, Five and a half to six and a half weight steer or six late six weight steers, um, and then this last week, so last Friday's average prices is the red line here uh, for the 13th of September. And again, additional weakness here, especially on the calf side, um, and relative to you know two weeks ago, uh, still a little bit weaker. Notice that there's not as much pressure on these bigger feeder cattle. And so one of the things that's starting to happen with this line, and it happens almost every year, it's a very common uh, tendency in Oklahoma, is for this line to kind of get a flat spot through here. Uh, now you think about that, and it means that the price is not falling very fast as you're adding weight on cattle, and that has implications for our stocker margins. Um, you know, typically we get a more pronounced kind of a bend in this market at about uh, 550, 575 pounds. Right now, the thing that stands out to me is the fact that these calf prices are as weak as they are. Um, I anticipate that we will see some stocker demand, and we may actually see these prices move counter-seasonally a little bit higher uh, through late September into the first part of October, at least. Uh, but with that remains to be seen. I really didn't anticipate the weakness that we've had now. Uh, I don't know that I have a, a really good explanation for that, So, but it's there. And so, uh, you know, again, we'll probably see these calf prices uh, stabilize or go a little higher, and then we'll, we'll tend to see uh, these prices, uh, again, kind of uh, flatten out across here. And that's pretty common. We'll look at the value of gain implications of that uh, here in just, in just a minute. And, oh, this is stepping through the lines, except they all came up at once. There we go. So if you take those prices off of that chart for this last week uh, over here, so we've got 450-pound steers at uh, 152. Um, we've got, uh, you know, 650-pounders at 139, 750-pounders uh, at 139. So really, again, pretty flat across there um, with very little change in price as we put on weight. If you look at a 450 pound beginning weight, so if you start with this steer, assuming that you're buying it uh, as a stocker, and look at it in the current market terms, um, put start putting weight on it, you can see the value of gain. Uh, I've highlighted in yellow here the implications of 250 pounds of gain, kind of a rough number for a stocker operation or a stocker enterprise. And so it would say that at current prices, if we could buy and sell in the same market, at today's prices, the value of those 250 pounds would be about $1.12 a pound. If you look at a 500 pound steer, a little bit bigger, the value of gains a little bit higher. And that actually is very common, again, because you get that flat spot in that price line in Oklahoma. The highest values of gain will typically be in that 550 to 650 
uh, range. And so it's kind of a question of where you want to start on the front end. Um, right now, uh, the the uh, the lightweight calf prices are again. I think they're probably a little oversold. Uh, so there's probably a little bit of a buy opportunity. Uh, for these uh, lightweight stockers right now, if a person is in a position to go ahead and and uh, and, and get them bought right now, uh, obviously that has implications for the whole winter in terms of what you're going to do with them and how big they're going to get and and all of that. Um, I don't know that there's good odds that they go up a lot, uh, but they could actually go up counter seasonally here again for the next month or so if we start to see uh, some significant demand for that. So. Um, I'm going through these relatively fast, um, so if you have questions, uh, be thinking about those, and we'll take as much time as you want to to discuss these. Uh, I don't have, uh, well, I don't have a, a full-blown series. The other thing that I look at here is, um, you know, what's the cost of wheat pasture? I always get questions this time of the year, and I suspect many of you do as well. What's wheat pasture going to cost this year? Um, and most of you know that I get pretty cagey about throwing out a number because it's a thin market and everybody wants to hear somebody else's number and then that becomes the market and I don't think it's uh, my business uh, or in general our business to be setting that market. Uh, once we start to hear numbers, uh, you know, we can pass those along to other producers. But the one thing we, the one thing we can do is, is take a look at, uh, at what it costs to grow this wheat pasture. So this budget is one that I do most every year. Um, it's, it's assuming a, a dual purpose wheat approach. And so this is looking at the additional cost uh, that you would probably make or recognize relative to then planning to go ahead and harvest the wheat uh, after pulling off in the spring. Uh, you know, the research shows that there is some yield loss. You can argue about what that number is. You can argue about what price to put on it, but here's the numbers that I've come up with. Uh, with a little help from uh, Dr. Anderson and from Trent, and uh, and so we've got a we've got a, a, an estimated uh, opportunity loss, if you will, for uh, for the yield loss from grazing wheat through the winter. We're going to have to top dress it, put on some additional fertilizer uh, to uh, compensate for the forage that we're removing. Um, you know, normal recommendations are to increase the seeding rate a little bit if you plan to graze it. And so we get uh, a total cost per acre of uh, $64.60 in this case. And if you convert that under a variety of assumptions back to uh, the wheat pasture cost, uh, it depends on how long you're going to graze it. Um, although, you know, if you're going to pull off for dual purpose, there's a, certainly a fixed end on the other end, but you may have some, some uh, variation on the front end. Depends on your gain assumptions. Here I'm going to use two and a half pounds a day. I'll show you a, 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 another one with a little bit lower rate of gain as a comparison. And uh, and I'm assuming that we're going to stock these uh, this wheat at 400 pounds to the acre. Uh, so if we start with a 475 pound steer, uh, it's going to take 1.2 acres per head. And uh, if you divide that out, that means uh, based on this amount of gain, um, that means that that wheat pasture cost is equivalent to about 26 cents a pound on a pound of gain basis. Um, for bigger animals, uh, if you hold that stocking rate constant, which uh, some people do, some don't, but if you hold that stocking, uh, that stocking rate constant and increase the acreage then for the larger animals, uh, it raises the cost on a pound of, uh, pound of gain basis. You could even go up here to the six weights. And so, what you get in this case, again, under these assumptions, uh, is, is a cost of uh, wheat pasture, um, sort of a partial budget approach that's going to be in generally in the range of 25 to 35 cents a pound. Um, now, you know, a wheat pasture producer or, or a wheat producer that's that's going to offer wheat pasture for lease to somebody else uh, is probably not going to do it for nothing. This covers the cost more or less. Uh, so the question is, how much more would they uh, expect beyond that? And, and uh, you know, I would imagine it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 cents. Uh, additional to that uh, would be what I would suspect they would expect. If you calculate this out, if you if the if the wheat producer adds a, a dime uh, to this wheat pasture cost, that will net them back about $25 an acre for the pasture. Uh, rental above the cost of the wheat pasture. 
uh, and it goes down a little bit for the bigger animals. Be somewhere between 20 and $25 if they add 10 cents uh, to this uh, wheat pasture cost. Cost. I think I've got another budget in here that uh, shows the impact of, now in this case, everything's the same. Uh, no, it's not the same. I got the wrong budget in here. Sorry about that. This is uh, at a higher, I think this was last year's budget um, with a higher wheat price. So sorry about that. I grabbed the wrong one. I think if you, uh, if you, if you, Take the same thing uh, as far as the budget cost and drop it to down to two pounds a day gain. Uh, then it raises this to about 30 to 40 uh, cents a pound uh, on the uh, on the budget cost. Um, and so uh, again, it'll be a little bit higher if you have lower gain. You're not getting as many pounds of gain to cover that that wheat pasture cost. Sure enough, I got the budget in here that doesn't say September 2019. Sorry about that. So, uh, if we put that together uh, into a kind of a generalized budget, I've got two different ones and they show a lot of variation. And I think this is the, uh, the challenge that we're in right now uh, as, far as, uh, as far as this wheat pasture situation. If you assume that you could buy at last week's prices more or less, so I put a 475 pound steer in here at a buck 50. Um, if you could still buy that in uh, in late October, I'm assuming we're going to start uh, start grazing in November one. Uh, so I'm sort of assuming that this thing just kind of moves sideways between now and then, implicitly at least. That's what I'm assuming. Um, two and a half pounds a day. I'm putting in 45 cents a pound uh, in this budget. Now I told you I don't like to throw out numbers, but I just did, obviously. Um, and so again. I would be careful about saying that that's what the market is for wheat pasture. I have no idea what the market is for wheat pasture this year. Uh, we want to wait and see. But in order to look at a budget, you got to put a number in there somewhere. So this is what I put in there for the time being. Um, and again, I've got other assumptions here, all of which can be questioned and adjusted and so on. Uh, but under these conditions, you'd have a uh, roughly 775 pound steer after about 120 days. Uh, coming off in late February, 1st of March. Uh, and in this case, the break-even price for that animal calculates out to about $1.25 a pound. Um, and it gives you about 250 uh, pounds per acre of, of gain. Again, all of those assumptions can be changed, so you can do all kinds of sensitivity analysis about that. But uh, it, under these conditions, which uh, honestly I think this price is too low, um, but it was that last week. So there was an opportunity to buy these steers at about this price uh, at, the, at the current time, whether or not it'll still be that way in, in uh, you know, late October or somewhere along in there uh, remains to be seen. Break-even selling price of 125 about. If you look at uh, March feeder futures right now, uh, when I pull this again this morning earlier, uh, March feeder futures were at about 131, uh, almost 132, and they were working their way a little bit higher uh, this morning. The last time I checked, um, so uh, you know if that's where the futures is at for March at this point in time. Um, if you look at basis, a 750 pound steer in February to March has a basis around $1.75 more or less uh, if you're right on that kind of late February, early March time frame. Uh, we're looking at a steer that's 25 pounds heavier than that and uh, that actually would pull that basis down to just about zero. So you can essentially for, for a 775 pound steer in February, uh, February into late February into March, you can assume a zero basis. So that would suggest that uh, right now you could lock in a dollar thirty-one to a dollar thirty-two. That would cover that uh, that budget cost. In fact, it looks pretty darn good for the way these budgets typically look. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a situation that's that's going to last very long. If you go back to that October futures um, and look at where it's at, and again, it was kind of making a run this morning, but. Uh, you know, at around 135, 136, 
and you look at November, so we're not actually, or at late October, we're not actually going to buy this calf for another month at least. Um, if you look at a 450 pound steer in October into November, um, and we're looking at a 475 pound steer, so a little bit bigger, uh, kind of average between these months, and, and you can do this more precisely, but I'm using rough numbers here. You can figure a basis, uh, historical average basis of about $30, $31 for that 475 pound steer in, uh, in late October. So that said, if you take 130, it was 135 about when I was actually looking at it this morning, it's gone higher, uh, and apply a 30 or $31 basis to it, that would suggest that that 475 pound steer is not going to cost $1.50 in October. He's going to cost more like $1.66. Uh, that's what I used in the budget here um, for a second version of that. So I think everything else is the same here, except that I put in a significantly higher price. That's a wide range. Um, if you believe the seasonal pattern, you know, you could say we're going to be where we're at or lower. If you believe the futures market, it would suggest that we're going to be significantly higher than that. Um, and so in this case, everything else is the same. Uh, you get a, a break-even price of 135 uh, for, those, uh, for that calf coming off in, in late uh, February and early March. If you remember our uh, March feeder futures, I don't know that I put them in here again. I don't think I did. Nope. Um, it was at 131 about, uh, so we're not covering it all. Um, you know, my experience has been doing it this time of the year and, and trying to do budgets. Most of the time, if you can get it to basically break even, that's about what the market's going to offer most of the time. It'll pay all the costs. Now, we're building in some extra cost here. This doesn't mean that the producer, even if we meet break even here, doesn't mean that the producer is not making anything. We're getting paid for our labor because I've put in uh, yardage fees. We, we're paying for the wheat pasture, which we may own or we may not. Uh, that can uh, that depends on uh, the situation. Uh, we're putting in, uh, you know, so a little bit extra. So it, it doesn't mean we're not making any money, but we're not making anything above and beyond uh, sort of the normal return to uh, to our resources, including our own uh, time and labor. Um, where are we going to be? I mean, $16 difference in the buy price is a pretty big range. I'm pretty sure that, you know, I, I think this is probably a little too high. Um, here in September, the basis is not running average, which is what this was based on. Uh, the, the basis has been running a little weaker than that. So you would probably pull this price down if you, again, if you want to use the futures market to sort of anticipate where we're going to buy these animals as well as where we would be selling them next spring. Um, uh, I think the current price probably is a little too low. And so, you know, again, I think there may be a short-term buying opportunity here. In fact, uh, this week's, what is today's? Today's only Tuesday. Yesterday's Oklahoma City prices were starting to show a little bit of strength back in these feeder cattle markets, um, uh, including the calves. And so I wouldn't be surprised, again, if we don't see that for, an, for another two or three weeks. So, so there may be a, a better than average buying opportunity here. Uh, for the next, uh, uh, in, in, here in the very short run, that, that's probably going to be pretty fleeting. I've run some budgets earlier this year, uh, and again, we're kind of all over the place, but in general, it looks to me like it's kind of a uh, an average year. Um, I don't think there's any, you know, real big uh, opportunities in here. Um, at the same time, it looks like, uh, depending on, uh, you know, how things uh work out specifically that there's a, there's a decent opportunity for these budgets to kind of work on average. I think probably the bigger question, of course, will be risk. Uh, there is a lot of volatility in these markets. The futures is particularly volatile. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you, you need to think about that. The producer needs to think about that in terms of uh, if you see an opportunity, uh, just because it's there, it's offered right now in the futures market, uh, it can certainly change pretty fast. So. Um, we're about 30 minutes into this. That's really what I had to offer this morning, but I would love to take some additional questions on either any of this or any other general market stuff. I didn't want to put in a lot of the general market stuff this morning, but I'd be happy to take uh, questions on it if anybody has anything.
pretty quiet out in the country today. Feel free to answer <laughs> questions in the lower in the chat box in the lower right hand corner, and Dr. Peel will be glad to answer them for you. You know, again, we've had so much dynamics in this market from the last month, and and again, a lot of that was the shakeout following the uh, the packing plant fire. Um, I will just say, uh, going into a little more detail on that, that I think. Uh, uh, you know, on the on the uh, box beef side, that stuff has worked through the market uh, pretty clearly, and so box beef prices are actually back down uh, where they were prior to the fire. Um, they're a little bit higher, but they actually seasonally move a little bit higher this time of the year. So that part's out there. Uh, the biggest thing that's still going on relative to that has been the uh, the uh, the fed cattle market has remained under under pressure. Um, and, and I think that is, is not surprising, really. Uh, I think it will uh, work its way through the system, but it's probably going to take a few more weeks uh, to work this fed cattle side out. We are really pushing packing plant capacity with the loss of this plant. Um, we had packing, plant, uh, packing plants operating closer to capacity prior to the fire than we've had in probably uh, 10 years or more. And so... Uh, really probably closer to 20 years. And so uh, so we were pushing that capacity and then to lose that other plant or this plant at, at that point in time has really pushed the industry to, uh, uh, to the limits of capacity. It's causing a lot of contortions out there. Some of these fed cattle that would have been slaughtered at that plant are getting shipped in some cases several hundred miles away. Uh, to, to shift them to another location and so on. So there's a lot of contortions going on uh, particularly in that fed cattle market side to sort of make this work. Now the industry has done a pretty good job of compensating for the loss of that packing capacity. Uh, slaughter actually didn't drop very much. It did drop slightly after the week after the fire and since then it's been running very close to pre-fire levels but we're doing it with lots of extra things. So uh, big Saturday kills is making up for lower uh, capacity on a Monday through Friday basis and so um, so we've done a pretty good job of covering that, uh, again, with lots of contortions. Um, the one thing that does concern me, uh, if we have to continue to do this until uh, December or so, when Tyson is saying they think the plant will come back online by the end of the year, uh, it may be difficult to maintain this sort of uh, stress level of, of extra uh, uh, slaughter uh, that we're seeing right now. It may be hard to maintain that. For an extended period of time. Uh, Saturday kills are something you can tap once in a while or for a, 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 a brief period of time, but you typically can't continue to do that on an extended basis. So we may continue to see some, some stress in there in terms of maintaining these slaughter levels uh, as we go forward from here. Okay, Scott, uh, any thoughts on cattle inventory numbers and expectations as we get near uh, the end of the year? and looking at the January 1 inventory numbers, um, beef cow inventory specifically. Uh, you know, the, the mid-year cattle inventory report kind of confirmed what, uh, what I've been thinking, what most analysts I think have been thinking, that we're really at a plateau in cattle numbers. And I'm calling it a plateau rather than a peak because, you know, historically this industry has you know, has done too much and too not enough. So we do too much. We build up numbers past the point where the market can really sustain prices. Uh, and that pushes us into lower prices and then sets off a, a liquidation. We haven't really done that. And I still don't think we're doing that, uh, even though we've got all these other dynamics out there right now that are adding noise to the system. I think we're at more of a plateau than a peak. Um, thus far, uh, my fears notwithstanding, uh, beef demand has matched the increase in beef production that we've seen over the last uh, four years. Uh, we actually bottomed near term here. We bottomed beef production in 2015, and we've been building it. We're at record levels uh, last year and this year. We're at uh, all-time record levels for beef production in the U.S. And so uh, in some sense, it's, it's probably remarkable that we have not seen more pressure than we've had. Uh, again, demand has been good. Now, uh, there's a little more weakness this year that does make me nervous. Uh, exports are actually down slightly this year. We had three years of double-digit growth in exports that really helped us move that additional beef production through the marketplace. And uh, 
this year we're you know we're we're down slightly on exports. We're seeing some weakness. We've got some weakness in Japan, which is our biggest market. That's one of my concerns. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of trade issues out there that again uh, are causing uncertainty and and really are are sort of uh, keeping us from being able to make more progress uh, in these markets. So. So there's some reasons to be a bit concerned. Uh, at the same time, I don't see any of it translating into an inevitable liquidation at this point. So I'm going to say January 1, 2020, cattle numbers will be virtually flat to a year earlier, uh, you know, plus or minus a, a slight change one way or the other. They could actually be down slightly. They may be up slightly. But probably within the range, I would guess at this point, within the range of a half a percent uh, plus or minus of unchanged from, from a year ago. Uh, somebody's asking for a copy of the slides after the presentation. Absolutely. I'd be uh, happy to share these with anybody. You can just uh, drop me an email, and uh, uh, and I'll be happy to, to share these slides. Uh, anything on the horizon for dairy cattle influence on beef markets? Um, there's a couple ports, uh, parts to that question, I think. You know, one is, uh, as we have grown cattle numbers over the last five years, dairy cow numbers have been flat to slightly lower. So when you look at just as a proportion uh, in terms of both feeder animals, uh, so the, the, the dairy calves, that the steers specifically that wind up on the beef side, uh, and the ratio of uh, dairy cows and beef cows has come down from what it was in 2015. We have very... Uh, high proportions of dairy animals in the marketplace just because beef numbers were down. And so that part's changed. The other part that you may be asking here, Scott, is, uh, you know, we're hearing more talk about um, the the growing tendency for dairies to be uh, to be using beef breed crossbreeds on, on these dairy animals and producing a crossbred animal. Uh, in the U.S., for many, many years, we've had a very clean line between the dairy industry and the beef industry, even though some of those dairy animals wound up on the, you know, obviously they all become part of the beef supply at some point. Uh, but what we're seeing now with uh, with the sex semen uh, and the ability for the dairy industry to target the heifers they need uh, on the breeding side, and then that opens up the rest of the, uh, the cows they can uh, and are using uh, more beef breeds to produce a crossbred animal, uh, which relative to a straight dairy animal has more value on the meat side, on the beef side. And so uh, we don't have very good numbers on that, and I'm not sure we're going to have good numbers, but what I hear anecdotally is that that's actually a pretty significant trend. Uh, and so it's it's going to add some new dynamics to some of these beef markets um, in terms of uh, you know the influence they have, obviously we're talking about uh, adding some more muscle to these animals and so on. But but even how they operate, how they look, and whether or not we are able to uh, distinguish them, and, and whether or not they'll be priced differently or or not, is uh, there's some coming issues there that will have some influence uh, on the meat and cattle feeding side in particular. I hope this is a little bit helpful. Again, if you need these slides, they will be changing, uh, no doubt. And I you know. Uh, those value of gain uh, and, and weekly price line, uh, I update those every week this time of the year. I anticipate doing that for, for quite a while now. So at any point in time, if you need uh, uh, updated information on any of that, well, uh, just let me know and I'll be happy to share that. Um, and we'll watch these dynamics. Probably, uh, again, more dynamics in this market right now than we had seen for quite some time uh, prior to this. All righty. Thank you very much, Dr. Peel. Um, we do appreciate everyone letting us know how we're doing, and so if you could fill out a sh the short survey that I'll link to in the chat box, I'd really appreciate it. And yes, thanks for filling out the survey, and we will see you next month.